Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Joan Batorf. I'm a professor in the School of Nursing at the UBC Okanagan campus and director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. And um, I'd like to begin this afternoon by acknowledging that the land on which we gather here in Kelowna today is the traditional unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their people. But I also know that many of you are joining us both from near and far. And I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners, past and present of those lands as well. So I'm uh, delighted to see so many people joining us this afternoon for this very important topic. And we have a panel of three speakers this afternoon, all uh, uh, experts here at UBC. And um, I'm going to just briefly introduce each speaker and each person is going to present, do a short presentation, and then we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards. So you'll notice that the Q&A um, icon at the bottom of your screen is open. We're not using the chat today, but we're using the Q&A. And at the end of the three talks, we will go through those questions and comments uh, in the remaining time we have available. So take notes, um, jot down your questions, pop them into the Q&A and we'll uh, chat after our talks. So today we have three people on our panel. The first is Dr. Septe Pakpur, who is an assistant professor in the School of Engineering in the Faculty of Applied Science at UBC Okanagan. And we also have Dr. Julie Bettinger, who is Associate Professor, Division of Infectious Diseases in the Vaccine Evaluation Center in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC Vancouver. And finally, we have Dr. Marie Tarrant, who is Professor and Director of the School of Nursing in the Faculty of Health and Social Development here at UBC Okanagan. And I want to thank our three panelists for joining us today. And we're going to start with Dr. Pakpur. And I think you're going to begin and share your screen. Thank you very much, Joanne. Uh, can you guys see my screen and is my voice clear? Yes, it, both are fine. Thank you. No worries. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my great uh, honor to be here, and uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about viruses in general first, and then focus on fighting flu from diagnostic perspective. When I was a kid, back in my home country, what I was worrying about most was either a war or a natural disaster like earthquake. Those who have been grown up in um, uh, Iran, I'm pretty sure that they are familiar with the image that I have shared right now. This is why we always had an emergency bag filled with canned foods and supplies down in the basement to be used at emergency situations. But in all those emergency times, I have this sweet memory of being surrounded with loved ones while it was an active bombing or even an earthquake. Although war has been a frequent and dark side of human history, but today a global catastrophe doesn't look like this. Instead, it's between nature and human, led by viruses such as influenza virus, SARS-CoV-2, HIV, or Ebola. We are right now living this war and to be honest with you, an infectious virus can kill more individuals than a war globally. And contagious ones even force individuals to self-quarantine and separate themselves from their social life. To me, it is scarier than my childhood fear experience. The question here is that, are these new threats? The answer is no. Humans have been battling viruses since before our species uh, had even evolved into its modern form. But the science of virology is relatively young. Just in the past hundred years, we were able to distinct viruses from bacteria. 
in the last 16 years, 60 years, we were able to understand their composition and how they work, or even look at them under microscope. But in the last 20 years, the um, revolution of modern technology has led to an explosive increase in our knowledge of viruses and their interactions with their host. But I'm pretty sure all of you guys know, but for one individuals who may not be familiar with what is a virus, what is a virus, let's just start from the basic. What are viruses? This is the definition. Viruses are subcellular infectious agents that are obligate intercellular parasites. What does it mean? It means they are very, very small. If I show you a human cell, it's like a blood cell, the size is 10,000 um, nanometers. A bacteria like E. coli is 3,000 nanometers. Viruses are much smaller. It ranges from 17 nanometers to the largest one, which is a mini virus, to 750. So we are dealing with the tiny organisms. If you, I want to visual, if you want to visualize it, if you consider your cell the size of a classroom, the, uh, the actual size of the virus is a, is a soft ball in that classroom. Then they need another organism to infect and to leave. It means they need to infect a bacteria or an animal cells or a plant cells. And once they are inside that in cell, they survive. If you look at these, you can see that viruses have different shapes, but they are common in three in two major characteristics. One is that they have a genes, a genomic materials, very small. It is surrounded or it's grouped by a, by a protein shell. It's called capsid. Some of them has a secondary layers. It's called it's made of lipid and it's called envelopes. The capsid and envelope needs, they are there to protect the gene of the uh, virus uh, from the surrounding environments. Let's look at the influenza virus. How does it look? It looks like this. As I told you, it has a genomic materials within the cell. There is two layers. It has its protein capsids and also the envelope capsids. And there are these proteins spiking out. These proteins are needed that the virus infect our cells and also the virus leave our cells. And I should mention that they are very relatively unstable at room temperatures. They need their host to survive. So through virology, we started understanding them better, but viruses have been always um, a, a focus to research just because they can cause serious illness in humans or domestic animals or even plants. During this graph, you can see on the x-axis, I have the year and on the y-axis, I have the death per 100,000 population per year. In the past, actually, the century, progress in the control of infectious disease through improved sanitization, water supplies, vaccines, better medical care, they've been dramatically reduced the threat to human health from these agents. You can see at the beginning of the 20th century, 0.8% of the total population died each year for, from infectious diseases, but today the rate is less than one-tenth as great. Even for SARS-CoV-2, the fatality is it's much under control, more controllable than before. But look at this graph. I want you um, and actually uh, look at this um, a spike happened in 1918. It's influenza pandemic. In 1918, we encountered the largest pandemic in re recent history, causing 20 million deaths worldwide. In, but it wasn't the last one. It came back. It came back in 1957, in 1968, and the last one in, was 2009. What I want to show you here in this graph is that look at the strain of the virus for each pandemic happened in the past hundred years. The strain of virus changes. We are not dealing with the exact same enemy. It changes itself and actually we are not ready for, um, uh, for, for this new enemy.
But why they do that? Because they are really good at it, especially the viruses that they component, the genetic material is RNA. They actually, they can change very rapidly. They can, once in a while, when there is a lucky combination of mutations through two different paths, one is for antigenic drift, is that when the gene within this uh, virus changes is slowly, just look at this virus, it slowly it changes and it changes the type of the protein on the surface. But the second, the second way is called shift. And it's when two viruses infect exact same cells, they share their genetic materials. As a result of this share, it, re it leads to a sudden change in a virus. And usually these result in pandemic strains. So we had multiple viruses here, distinct from each other. They shared their genetic materials. And now we are dealing with a sudden change in the virus that we, we have no clue what they are. And this leads to pandemics, and especially if we don't have, you're not ready for them, or uh, it gets to the population so fast, then the controlling it, it, it gets harder. But do, is it just a handful of organisms that we are talking about, or we are dealing with larger number of organisms? I would say Viruses are the largest number of the most abundant and diverse entities on these planets. It's been claimed that there are more viruses on Earth than stars in the universe and, uh, and estimated to be around 10 to the power of 31. And if you lay them back to back, it actually would stretch from 100 million light years. They do a lot, for example, in the ocean because of the infecting, they keep infecting bacteria with the rate of 10 to the power of 23 per second. They remove 20% to 40% of all bacterial uh, cells each day. But the next question is to know, is all, all these viruses harmful to humans? And I would say no, because in one of my research, I showed that if I you just focus on and a gut of individuals, a healthy individuals that it harbors different microbes, it harbors bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and we need them for our survival because they can, they are uh, or, uh, kind of uh, regulating our immune system, our metabolites, and so many other factors. Thousands of viruses exist in our gut, and we just started learning about them. Look at the first graph, it's the first donor, it's the healthy donor, and the second column is the second donor. They are both healthy. From the first one, I collected samples over a year, and the other one over two years. The bottom graph shows you the, how bacterial community at virum level changes, and the top one, it changes how viral community changes. For the bacteria, for example, look at the gray. This is a big phylum of bacteria. They're quite stable. They are always present. But look at the virus for donor A. The purple one is a group of viruses, Cifovirida. They show up, but then they disappear. The second group of viruses show up. And we started knowing that, oh, they, they have a huge impact on our health. And I'm sure they are regulating our gut bacteria and they are regulating our other um, activities. And the, another interesting point is that we are different from in our viruses in our gut. And it should be that that's why we are different maybe in, in, in terms of health or disease. So not necessarily they are, um, and, and all of them are actually harmful, but why we are really behind understanding viruses, including if, uh, uh, flu, is that there are major challenges related to for the detection, for their isolation or their identifications. When they are in low abundance, it's really hard to get them to, to actually isolate one. The t technologies um, 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 are actually behind sometimes. They are getting better, but they are not ac that sensitive. And then we don't have enough libraries that if a new strain comes in, we identify, we actually put a name on it and say, okay, this is this virus. Look, focusing on the techniques that just for the flu, there are three major techniques for identification and detections. One is the culturing. 
this is just, it's time consuming, but this is necessary because you need to get the virus. It's really rare. You need to propagate them, increase the numbers, and then start studying it. And be, without this step, we certainly cannot identify a new strain. The other technologies are rapid antigen testings. This technique solely focus on the proteins that I showed you on this, uh, that are on the surface of the capsids. And uh, they are rapid, they can give you results in 30 minutes, but in the next chapter and uh, uh, slide, I will tell you what are the problems. And the last one is the PCR, which looks at the gene of these uh, viruses and identify these viruses using their genes. All of them are fascinating. They helped us a lot, but they need training. They need lots of, they need experts to, uh, to run them. And those that they don't need such much expertise, the sensitivity is not, the accuracy is not really high. For example, for the rapid flu tests, they are between, the accuracy is between 50 to 90%. It means it really depends on uh, how long you've been sick, how the samples was collected, how it's been stored, uh, what is the flu activity. And we get the false negative rate uh, responses, for example, when you have the flu, but the test doesn't detect it. And we also sometimes get false positive tests uh, that uh, when you don't have a flu, but it says, yes, you do have a flu. And the other problem with the current technology is that it's all at the individual level. So it's just, you need to get sick or there, and then they can be detected and, and high concentration, and then they can be detected. What I do in the lab, actually, I think that I'm working with um, a, a, a number of fa faculties and collaborators to connect nanotechnology and molecular biology to lab on chief and engineering, and also to data science and computer visions to develop a um, systematic uh, approach for a culture independent virus isolation and detection, not only from biological individual samples, but also also from um, uh, environmental samples. I think the only way to win this war is to get prepared and to also for preparation, it's better to have a population-based surveillance system that can isolate virus in environmental samples like air when they are at low quantity and also provide some predictions to tell us how far we are from next pandemic and it help us to pr predict or to manage uh, a current pandemic. So I think with better diagnostics and better pre preparations for uh, surveillance or the population-based diagnostics, we can fight flu. And the next speaker will talk about vaccinations and how it can um, uh, actually, how that can help us to win this war. Thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Packport. We'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Bettinger, Julie. Great, thank you. Let me just uh, get my slides up. Coming, there we go. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. I'm very happy to present um, some of the findings from a safety monitoring network that I run. It's called the Canadian National Vaccine Safety Network, or CANVAS. And we've been conducting active safety surveillance for influenza vaccines since 2009. And so we monitor uh, both the pandemic vaccine when it was out in 2009 and then moved to seasonal influenza vaccines. And so the objective really of the network is to provide enhanced surveillance capable of giving rapid safety data in various age groups and for various, for seasonal influenza, various vaccine products. And we provide this information to public health authorities um, as well as uh, researchers and other individuals. And we've given it, as I've mentioned already, primarily for seasonal influenza vaccines and the pandemic influenza vaccine, but it has also been used for other new vaccines such as meningococcal B uh, when it was distributed in a few jurisdictions in Quebec. And um, we're gearing up for our um, COVID vaccines, which uh, looks like they'll be arriving soon. 
So for our vaccine safety surveillance for influenza vaccine, we have a network of over 50,000 participants, which includes a control group of approximately 15,000 15, unvaccinated participants. And what makes our network somewhat unique is that this enables us really to, to calculate um, relative risk and rate, rate ratios. So we actually are collecting events in two groups, those that have been vaccinated and those that have not been vaccinated. And we can really see if we see a difference in the two groups. We have a, a, a control group to look at to see if they're seeing similar events. So the surveillance is set up in five provinces, British Columbia, Alberta, Quebec, Ontario, and Nova Scotia. And we recruit participants from public health immunization clinics, pharmacies, and hospital clinics. And then where our control group comes from is it is our previous year's vaccinated participants. And so we email out an online survey two weeks prior to the start of an, the immunization campaign in each of the jurisdictions where we collect information. For our vaccinated group, we mail out an, or email out an online survey eight days after immunization. So essentially capturing information on that first week following immunization. And then for both our control and our vaccinated group, for those individuals that report an event that required medical attention, we do a telephone follow-up to elicit more information on what that event was for. And for the vaccinated group, sometimes those events are also reportable to the passive surveillance system. So we ensure that the events flow into that system. And we try to do these uh, follow-up phone calls about 72 hours after the event is reported to us. So it's quite timely. So our online survey for both of our groups is capturing health events that are occurring for our vaccinated group in the first seven days after vaccination or in our control group in the previous week before they received the survey. So what we're looking for essentially are any new health events or if someone has a, an existing health condition, if it gets worse over that time period. We do send reminder emails out to the individuals who don't respond. So we're, uh, collecting information not on everything, what we're really looking for are, are severe events. And th what these are, are events that would cause an individual to miss work, or if they're a child, to miss school or daycare. Uh, an event that would prevent normal daily activities. So if it's a weekend and you wouldn't necessarily have to go to work, or if you're working at home due to COVID right now, if you're not able to get out of bed and do your daily activities, that's something we would want to know about. Or if the event causes a healthcare visit. We collect the same events in our control group so that we have that comparable group to compare to our vaccinated group. And then as I already mentioned, anyone who's actually seeing um, a healthcare provider, we follow up with a phone call and get more information. So here's some results from 2017 and 2018. So for both of these years, uh, we had a large number of our vaccinees enrolled, about 44,000 in 2017 and 38,000 or just over 38,000 in 2018, with a response rate in the high 60 percentile. And then for both of those years, 14% of the respondents were children. So we're capturing events across the age spectrum, not just in um, healthy adults who are often the group that are frequently included in the clinical trials. In our control group, again, remember that it is the previous year's vaccinated group. So in 2017, we had just, or just under 29,000 controls enrolled. And then if you can sort of see up here, this is the group, our 44,000 vaccinees would have become our control group for 2018. We had just over 43,000 enrolled and the response rate's a bit lower always in our control group. Uh, you know, individuals haven't been contacted for about 11 months, but we still do quite well for an online survey at uh, 47% in 2017. 2017 and up to 50% in 2018. And again, the proportion of children in both years was around 10 to 14%. So what's important to note for both of these years is that the majority of our participants reported no events. So 91% said they didn't have any health events to report. There were some that reported events, uh, so non-severe events. So this would be anything that didn't cause them to miss school, didn't prevent their daily activities, didn't require a medical visit. So you can see the non-severe events came in at about 5.5% in our vaccinated group compared to 5% in the control group. In 2017, it was slightly higher in the vaccinated group that year, 6.2%, but it was also slightly higher in our control group that year at 5.8%. When we get to our severe event category, now recall this is the events that will prevent daily activities or require a medical, um, a medical visit, you can see that the proportion is much lower than what we see with the non-severe events. So we had 3.3% in the vaccinee group compared to 
5% in the control. And this little asterisk here means that this is a significant difference. We are seeing significantly more events reported in our vaccinated group this year compared to what we're seeing in the background group or our, our control group. And in 2017, you can see as well, it was 3.2% compared to 2.4% in the control group. So what are the events that we're seeing here? Oh, and before I get onto that though, I should say the onset and duration is slightly different, um, interestingly enough, when you look at this. And it's also quite suggestive of potentially being related to the vaccine. So for a vaccinated group, 38% report the event within 24 hours of vaccination versus only 10% reporting it in the 24 hours prior to the survey being sent. For uh, the vaccinated group, over half, 55%, the event is resolved within 72 hours, again, versus our control group, where this is only 36%, where they have resolution within 72 hours. So what are the events? So here you have them for 2017 and 2018. Let me walk you through this slide. So you can see um, here for fever, 2017 is on the left, 2018 is on the right. You can see it was significantly higher in both years in our vaccinated group uh, with a rate ratio of 1.47 in one year and 1.53 in the other year. Um, and so anything above one on this line is higher. So I'm showing you the events that were statistically significantly higher in our vaccinated group here. You can see headaches uh, comes in similar in both of the years, 1.32 and 1.25. Systemic reactions, so this would be, uh, this would be achy, achiness, myalgia, muscle pain. Uh, that's coming in at about 1.21 to 1.26. And then nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea comes in at about 1.41 to 1.46. So very similar rates across the two years, and these are all higher in our vaccinated group. This is what's driving that severe event rate that I showed you that was slightly higher. So we looked at um, data over our last five years of surveillance um, and actually found that headaches were significantly more likely to be occurring in our vaccinated participants. And they had an adjusted odds ratio of 1.21. And as you can see from the confidence interval here, it is above one. And so it is statistically significantly higher. So what this would tell us is that if you're an immunization provider um, or even a healthcare provider who is recommending immunization, you probably want to be recommending some sort of analgesics such as acetaminophen at the time of vaccination because people are likely to be feeling unwell after they receive a vaccine and headaches are a very common occurrence in our vaccinated group and are occurring more frequently in vaccinated participants. For this study, we also looked at anesthesia and paresthesia. So this would be numbness and tingling. And what we found in this, with this um, symptom was that it was actually equal, equally likely to occur in our control group as it was in our vaccinated group. We couldn't detect any association with vaccine for this particular event. So in conclusion, the majority of our, seasonal, uh, of our vaccinees to receive the seasonal influenza vaccine have no health events following vaccination. Um, where we do see significant differences in the events in the vaccinated group, these are systemic events, so fever, headaches, myalgias, and gastrointestinal events, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and these are statistically um, significantly higher among our vaccinated group. What's reassuring about this with the vaccinated group is that these events are resolving within 72 hours of vaccination for the majority of participants. And the event profile that we're seeing in our surveillance is consistent with what we would expect for seasonal influenza vaccines. So part of the goal of our surveillance is to be able to detect signals or to detect something unusual or new. And certainly over the last 10 years of surveillance that, that we've been um, looking at influenza vaccines, we've not seen anything that was unexpected. So I would just like to recognize all of the investigators in, involved with the surveillance. Um, obviously, when you're recruiting 50,000 participants across Canada, this is not a small endeavor. And this sort of data collection would not happen without the continued participation of the people listed here on this slide. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to now turn to Dr. Tarrant. Okay, thank you, Joan. Just get my... Okay, can everyone see the screen okay? Yes? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is just some uh, data from across Canada about influenza vaccine uptake and things that are associated with uptake. So we're going to look at uptake rates in the general population and in some high-risk groups and subpopulations. 
What I'm not going to talk about is uh, actually the area where most of my work is, is with maternity, uh, pregnant women and with um, uh, children, because those are very different risk groups and the, the factors are quite different for all of those groups. So we're going to look at some reasons for not vaccinating and then characteristics associated with vaccination and then just some conclusions and also some information for you if you, or sources of information if you want to do further reading. So the goal in Canada is to have influenza vaccine coverage of about 80% in high risk groups. And that is primarily um, the older adult population, those over 65 years of age, and also uh, those with chronic uh, medical conditions. So of any age with chronic medical conditions. The overall rate in the general population is only about 35 to 40%. And that hasn't really changed all that much over the last five to 10 years. Um, and in all groups, it is higher in females than males. Um, and this is consistent with other data on other health behaviors as well. In recent years, actually more and more people are getting vaccinated in pharmacies. We all know we can't walk into a pharmacy in, in Kelowna or anywhere else without having signs for flu vaccines, especially this time of the year. So about 40% get vaccinated in pharmacies and only about 28% now are getting vaccinated in doctor's offices. But despite the convenience of getting vaccines in pharmacies, actually, the rates are not um, going up as much as we would hope. So this data here is, um, this is from the vaccine coverage survey, the Canadian vaccine coverage survey that is done every year by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And so this first group here, this is the whole adult population. So you can see that the vaccine vaccination rate has increased very slightly from about 36 to 42 percent over the last four influenza seasons. And then in the um, adult 80, 18 to 64 year age group that have no chronic medical conditions, the rate is about 25 to 30 percent with a slight increase. Um, there has been some increase in those in this group of 18 to 64 year olds that have a chronic medical condition. So it was 37% and now it's up around 44%. But you can see in the over 65 year age group, although it is high at about 70%, it's not at the target of 80% and it hasn't really changed much over the last four years. And this is just a look across Canada. I realize some of you are um, from BC, but many of you might be joining from other places. So you can see that the vaccine rate ranges from about 45% in Nova Scotia, that's about the high, and Nova Scotia for some reason consistently has higher influenza vaccination rates. It's only about 24% in Quebec. Most provinces are around the 30% mark, and you can see here in BC we're at about 32%. This is older data again, but um, that was all I could find that had all the provinces in it, but it, it has only increased marginally since, since that date. And then going back to the issue uh, highlighted previously, looking at gender. So you can see that across all four of these groups, there's about a seven to 10% difference with females being much more likely to be vaccinated than males. And that again is consistent with other um, health behaviors and not a surprise to anyone who looks at gender specifically and health outcomes and health behaviors. And I just wanted to show you um, these two graphs just to compare the BC rate with the Canadian rate. And you can see I put it on two graphs because actually if you overlaid them, they would almost be pretty well the same. So you can see in all of these three groups over 65, um, uh, 12 to 64 with a chronic medical condition and people with no chronic medical conditions, the rates are very similar in BC as they are Canada wide. There's not much difference in them. And then looking at some population groups, this slide shows um, uh, vaccine uptake rates by ethnicity. And you can see here in general that Asian communities, uh, according to this data, have some, some of the highest vaccine uptake rates, particularly in people who are 65 years of age and older. And actually, if you look at the Southeast Asian, Chinese and Japanese population, they're really hitting their target of about 80%. And subgroups such as uh, those from Latin America and West Asian or Arab populations have much lower vaccination rates. And the white population is here almost at 70%. 
and just some reasons that people report. The, the same um, vaccination coverage survey looks at why people do not get vaccinated. And so for most people, all groups are reporting that actually they don't feel that they need influenza vaccine. It's not necessary, they're healthy, they don't get sick. And so about anywhere from 17 to 20% just say, I don't need to get vaccinated, it's not necessary. And a lot of people just say they don't think of it, there's no specific reason, they just, it's not something that they think of doing. And then for a lot of people, actually, they may have intention to get vaccinated, but they just don't get around to it. They don't have time. They might not know where to get vaccinated and they just don't bother to do it. And then the only group that actually voiced concerns about the side effects and the vaccine are the over 65 year age group. You can see that's this group here. And so the ones who don't get it in that age group are more likely to say it's because they are concerned about the vaccine or concerned about side effects of the vaccine. And the Canadian vaccination survey also asks questions about knowledge and beliefs and attitudes about vaccination. And there's a lot of different items that they ask about, and I don't want to go into all of them, but when I was looking at the data, these two struck me. And this is with the whole group, uh, with the whole population that takes the survey. Um, over 90% of people were either agreed or strongly agreed that they had enough information to make an informed decision and that in general they considered vaccines to be important for their health. But when we, they asked questions specifically about the flu, over 40% of people either agreed or strongly agreed that you could get the flu from the flu vaccine, which is a very common myth about the flu vaccine, that it actually gives you the flu and that actually it's ineffective, that it doesn't protect you against getting the flu. So although we have this large group of people that think, yes, I'm well informed and yes, I, I know all of the information, I have enough information, we still have about 40% of people with common misperceptions about the flu vaccine. So just looking at, this was one study that looked at, um, looked at the determinants of, um, of seasonal influenza vaccine in, in Canadians, looking at three sort of separate groups, the 18 to 65 year old general adult group with no chronic medical conditions. So in this group, um, you'll see it's from 18 to 64, but the 18 to 44 year age group, so the younger half of that group, were about 50% uh, more likely to not be vaccinated. So age is a significant predictor of vaccination with younger people feeling it less necessary to get the vaccine. Again, males were about 50% more likely to not be vaccinated. And those who were not born in Canada were also about 60% more likely to not be vaccinated. And for adults with a chronic medical condition, the only thing that came out of the study was that if they were again part of that younger half of the age group, that they were almost three times more likely to not be vaccinated. And in older adults, uh, similarly age, so even though it's everyone over 65, sort of what we call the younger, older age people, those from 65 to 70, had about an 80% uh, more higher likelihood of not being vaccinated. Those with lower education were about twofold, uh, about a double the rate of not being vaccinated. And also those who would, we would consider the healthy older people. So they're older, over 65, but they don't have any chronic medical condition or chronic disease. So they're about twice as likely to, to not be vaccinated. So influenza vaccine uptake in key risk groups is suboptimal, um, particularly younger adults with chronic medical conditions. Their rates are only about 30 to 40 percent. Uh, so it's about less than half of what we would hope to see, uh, a rate of about 80 percent. Although in that group, the rates have improved some over time, uh, while they haven't really improved much in the older age group, but they're still substantially lower than what they should be. And so what we're finding is that the factors associated with influenza vaccine uptake are very similar to the factors associated with other health related behaviors, which is that younger age, male gender and lower education levels do affect vaccine uptake. 
And here's just a few um, resources, lots of great information, both from a provider perspective. Most of these pages have um, dual sort of sources of information for parents and, and the public, and then also for healthcare providers or for vaccinators. So you can check out any of these. And they have information on influenza vaccine, but all, all different types of vaccination. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. That's, uh, those are fabulous um, presentations and really gave us a whirlwind tour of um, various uh, parts and of dimensions that we need to know about uh, fighting flu. So wonderful. So I would just invite uh, participants, anyone joining us at this time, if you have questions and any questions or comments to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and uh, we can direct those to our panel. Um, while um, people are popping in questions, um, maybe we could, I could begin um, with a question and I'm, I'm wondering, um, Sep, Sepde, if you could just, uh, you talked about an antigenic shift when there's two viruses that end up in the same cell and create a new kind of virus. So I wondered if that's a concern at the moment, if someone gets the flu and also maybe the COVID virus as well, if we're likely to end up with something new and different coming out of that. Is that a concern? Not that I know of. No, these two viruses infect cells differently. Their host cells are very differently. Their receptors are very different. No, those, I don't think we should worry about the SARS-CoV-2 and influenza, but I think the, the actual uh, worriness is about uh, different strains of the influenza virus. We have three main uh, strains, influenza A, influenza B, and influenza C, and also influenza A has so many different kind of, uh, we have subtypes and then different strains, so the, the worriness is focusing, it's just on influenza. Okay, so when they come together in a cell, it needs to be two different types of influenza viruses? Well, the influenza virus has three subtypes, and it's influenza A, influenza B, and C. And these are influenza A has its own different strains, depends on the which H, uh, A protein and NA proteins they have on their surfaces. And uh, those are the, this uh, influenza A is the most um, critical one because they can, their host is human and also their host, uh, they can find them in animals, in swine, in horses, in birds. And uh, so um, usually pandemic, they, they, they just, uh, strains that uh, they have high fatality or they, they belong to influenza A, a group. And influenza B also can re lead to seasonal kind of uh, uh, pandemics, but uh, influenza C is only always a bit kind of present in low concentrations all the time. So, Great. Okay, thank you for that. I see we have a question from Negan. Um, I have a question with regards to diagnostic tools for DS DNA viruses versus SS DNA viruses. Does this affect their detection with the tools we currently have? I think that might be a question for you. That's yeah, me. yeah, that's a very good question, Megan. Actually, um, yes. So if I want to give maybe um, broaden, open up this question is that, um, as I mentioned, viruses have genetic material. Some of them has DNA and uh, some of them has a double-stranded DNA, some of them has one-stranded DNA, and influenza virus or SARS-CoV virus, they have RNAs instead of, mm -hmm. and then these RNAs, they can be um, um, positive strand or negative strands. I don't want to get into the de detail, but specifically for RNA viruses, we do have problems in um, biases in our technologies. So specifically, if you want to detect them in a community, uh, my 
in my research, I've shown that the current technologies are biased towards DNA viruses. So most of the time, many times, if you say, oh, we don't have any RNA virus in this community, actually it's because the extraction and the amplification is biased towards DNA viruses. It's not necessary that they are not present. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, while we wait for other questions, Julie, I'm wondering, um, I know that your group is testing the safety data of the vaccines every year. So that suggests to me that the vaccines are also changing each year, and I understand that. So how much do they change each year, and um, why do we need to monitor the vaccine safety so closely each year? Great. That's a great question. Um, so it, it really depends on how much the circulating influenza viruses change each year in terms of how much the vaccine will change. Um, and most of the components of the vaccine don't change. Uh, what ends up changing, if it's going to be changed, is if we see a new strain um, emerge and start circulating in the population, you want to make sure that the vaccine you're using is going to, to match the strain that's actually circulating and that people are getting infected with. And so the WHO um, determines each year, well, I think it's in about April or May in the spring, <laughs> um, they determine what the most prevalent um, influenza viruses are that are currently circulating and whether they match what we've got in our vaccines for that year. And so if they're seeing any shifts or drifts in what's actually out there circulating, they will then incorporate that into the vaccines in the Northern Hemisphere for that fall. Um, and then we also, I guess, have the advantage in the Northern Hemisphere of um, sort of monitoring what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere as their influenza season comes before ours. And so oftentimes we can take that information and, and use that as well in terms of what we're doing up here. Um, so, so what may change then is the actual strain that gets included in the influenza vaccine. And so that um, you, again, you wouldn't expect, you're not, you're not expecting anything different, but if you don't look for it, if you don't have the monitoring set up, you'll never find it. So it's, um, it's really more of a safety net, um, you know, and, and a signal detection, you know, I don't, and as I showed you in the data, you know, we don't, we haven't found anything unexpected, but I don't know that that's a reason not to do it. Um, and they did have one of the influenza vaccines that they used in Australia in 2010. Um, they, they did have seizures associated with that vaccine in children. Um, and, and again, that was one of the genesis for our project because it wasn't detected quickly and a lot of doses of that vaccine were given. And so they could have, if they'd had something that was a bit more timely than our passive surveillance system, they might have been able to stop using those doses more quickly. So it's, it's more of a safety net rather than any real concerns or rather than any real changes in the influenza vaccine each year. Great, that's very helpful. And so I heard something that not everyone's getting the same flu vaccine this year. Is that right? That older, the older adult get a different one than everyone else? Is that right? That, um, so it, it may depend on where you live. So because <laughs> I, I, I'm not quite sure. I, I, I'm hesitant to speak in general. My understanding for BC, although I hesitate to say this because I'll find out after I say this that it's varying by health authority. Um, but yes, that is correct. There's, a, there's what's known as a high dose influenza vaccine. And essentially it was developed um, because as, as you age, your immune system responds less effectively. It's just, it's, it's what happens with aging. Um, and there's not much you can do to counteract that effect. It's the effect of aging. And so oftentimes older um, individuals will not respond as well to our standard vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so this vaccine was designed in particular for seniors over the age of 65, because that's when you start to really see this decline in the immune system. And in particular, you know, in our older age group, so the 75 plus, it's even more pronounced. Uh, so my understanding, if I'm recalling correctly, and if any of the other panelists have more information, please speak up, um, is that it was designated uh, for all of our long-term care facilities for this year. Um, they had sort of a, a special number of doses and they wanted to prioritize who received that vaccine for the individuals who would most likely benefit from getting that high dose of, of influenza. Okay, so. great. 
All right. Well, that that kind of confirms the, the little bit that I heard. That, and so I'm assuming in your safety data, you'd be looking at those two different uh, types of flu vaccine then as well. Yeah. We do, and, um, I, and we do see some differences, interestingly, just in terms of the, the local reactions, so like the reactogenicity, so the, um, not, in, not in terms of a safety signal, but those vaccines do tend, they do stimulate the immune system more, and you can see that in the type of events that people tell us that they have after they get vaccinated. So it's one sign perhaps that it is working well. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. I see we have a question from Kevin and he asks with the current measures in place with COVID-19 with the COVID-19 pandemic are we expecting there to be less influenza this season is there any more or less important to be vaccinated this season uh, Marie do you want to take a stab at starting with that one Sure. Um, so the first, the answer to the first part of the question is yes. I think all across Canada, we are seeing much less influenza activity. So less serious influenza and less um, hospitalizations from influenza. And that's probably mostly due to, uh, you know, COVID pandemic control measures such as mask wearing and uh, social distancing and, and all of those kinds of um, activities. And this really mirrors what we saw last year, like in Asia, in the early parts of the pandemic, where mask wearing and social distancing measures were put in place very early, like in January, they basically had a very low level influenza season and the same thing with Australia and New Zealand in the Southern Hemisphere. So we are seeing a lot less influenza activity. Does that mean it's uh, any more or less important to get vaccinated? No, we're only, you know, at the end of November, early December yet. The worst is probably yet to come. Um, and it's important, I guess, from a couple different perspectives. One is that we don't want influenza complicating, uh, you know, COVID diagnosis and things like that. We don't want influenza spreading to uh, increase hospitalizations, particularly in those high risk groups like people who have chronic medical conditions and things like that. So it is uh, as important or more important this year to get the flu vaccine so you can really make sure that you don't get sick with influenza. And I think most people, uh, you know, most people don't want to go in a hospital or any kind of healthcare facility right now, even to their family doctor if they don't have to. So if you get the vaccine, then you're much less likely to have to do that over the influenza season. So I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but I would say please still get vaccinated. That's great. Thanks, Marie. Um, so can I ask a question of Julie as well? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. I, I was reading about these adverse events in New Brunswick. Uh, there's, you know, there's a whole batch of influenza vaccine. There's only three or four, very few events. But I, I'm just wondering if you have any, uh, you know, inside baseball knowledge or sort of any more <laughs> understanding of that. Right. So I think what you're referring to is there were three um, temporally. So when we say temporally, we mean uh, yes. associated in time, not caused by. I think that's a really important distinction to make because a lot of people um, automatically think, oh, if it happened after the flu vaccine, the flu vaccine caused it. And that's not at all what it is. And our systems are set up to sort of detect these things that are occurring in time after and then investigate it to see, okay, well, what caused it? Was there another cause? And so there were three sort of neurologic related events that occurred in New Brunswick, which is unfortunately not a place where we have a canvas um, site because um, we, you know, it came into the passive surveillance system. Uh, and, and so I don't have a lot of insider knowledge on it as it were, um, but, I, but what they were able to determine uh, based on the number of doses distributed, because again, there, there's not a control group for our passive surveillance. So then you're looking at, well, how many doses have we been given? And are we seeing anything above what we would expect to see with the doses that had been distributed up to that point, like with the normal number of doses distributed? And they didn't see any, there wasn't a signal there. So although they happened after the vaccine and they happened after each other and it, it raised alarm bells and they said, we need to look at this. When they looked at the data, they didn't see an effect from, you know, uh, they, they couldn't attribute it to the, the vaccine. And as well that, you know, when they do these reviews, they're also able to look at the full clinical picture. And I don't know, but oftentimes there are other um, things that, you know, some of them may have been sick with an infectious disease that could have also triggered what happened, uh, you know, and, and so oftentimes there are other clinical um, 
things going on that could equally explain what occurred. And, I, and for those three, I don't, I don't have that insider knowledge, but that may have also been part of it. Yeah, thanks. I think that's important because the media always reports the initial part of it, but they never do the follow-up on, the, on no, what's exactly. been resolved from it. Yeah, and I think it's a bit of a challenge because even for those in public health who may have had that information, um, you know, it's, it's personal health information. And so, you know, I think all they can say is we didn't find an association. And they can't really tell you much more, especially when there's only three events, without you then learning a lot about those three individuals and their individual health, health state. And, you know, I guess if the individuals say that's okay, you could do it. But, but I just think in terms of confidentiality, it, you have to be really careful. And I think it's important for people to sort of ask themselves how much of their own personal health knowledge, if they were that individual, would they want out there in the media? And so it's very hard to respond to, to that when it does play in the media, because I think most health professionals and public health practitioners have ethical standards that they're trying to meet in terms of how they're talking about these events um, that really put restrictions on what can be out there. Mm -hmm. So Marie, I'm wondering, given the low um, rates of uptake, especially among those uh, under 64, um, are there some strategies that, that you or others are recommending um, in terms of encouraging or increasing that uptake? Yeah, that's a difficult, uh, I guess, issue. I mean, the rates are going up marginally. Um, you know, we've put some of these things in place. In BC, vaccine is free for that age group. It's also, um, we do have expanded access points like pharmacies and, and nurse practitioners and things like that who will give it. So it's, um, it's a bit challenging. I think um, I don't want to just say, I mean, part of it is more education and more information, because even in that group, they don't feel vulnerable. They don't feel, um, you know, that they're really at heightened risk, and particularly younger of that sort of age group. So I think part of that, you know, has to come back to providers and things like that is strongly encouraging um, people with, particularly those with chronic illnesses, to get um to get vaccinated every influenza season because the other reason is people who get vaccinated regularly it's just part of their routine right so part of it is making it part of the routine so in terms of healthcare providers i think is making sure that we take every opportunity to promote influenza vaccine and we also uh, clarify some of those misconceptions that actually it doesn't give you the flu um, you know it's not it's a very safe vaccine as Julie has shown in her data so there's you know there's a lot of interventions that have been done um, most of them what I would say are marginally um, successful in that they do improve vaccination rates but they don't get them anywhere near what we would like to so as I think it's just a a broader sort of strategy of, uh, of at all levels, both in terms of um, increasing the demand among the per, among the the younger people, and then having these enhanced access options, and then having providers sort of reinforce the messages every time they're interacting with with that population. Great, thank you. Good, some good advice there for sure. Um, I see we're almost out of time. Um, our hour has gone by very quickly. I'm wondering if, um, if, if Sadeep, you have any closing comments and Julie that you want to share before we close. I don't have anything more than um, actually it adds to do what uh, other Julie and Marie mentioned. I guess that uh, as the population understand how viruses work and how vaccination can actually stop uh, their transmission from one person and one person and push them to actually mutate and become makes more strains, actually it helped them to find some rationale behind to go and take their dose vaccinations. Great, thank you, good advice. And I would just encourage people to get vaccinated for flu this season. Um, you know, we're already seeing our hospitals, uh, you know, struggling and, you know, do, do whatever you can to sort of help alleviate that burden. And if you haven't gotten your flu vaccine yet, please go do it. Great. Thank you. Well, with that, that's a good message to end on. And so I do want to take a moment to thank our three panelists to, for joining us today and 
uh, sharing uh, the latest research in the field of uh, flu vaccines. And I know that um, vaccinations are going to be top of mind as we move forward through uh, the rest of the winter season, first with the flu and hopefully in the new year, not too long off uh, a COVID vaccine as well. So thank you once again for joining us and for everyone who joined us online as well. And I hope you'll join us again for another session. So thanks again.